Well, um, good morning, folks. Um, this is our penultimate study in the book of Nehemiah. So that means just one more after um, this morning. And to date in this series, we've been thinking about uh, Nehemiah's burden, Nehemiah's project, and then last time we were thinking about Nehemiah's enemies. And today, we're going to be considering Nehemiah's example. Nehemiah's example. And unlike last time when uh, I had two chapters of Nehemiah to read, it's just a single chapter this morning, but we will read the entire chapter, and that is Nehemiah chapter 5. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have had to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are exacting usury from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, As far as possible, we have bought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, What you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves and houses, and also the usury you are charging them the 100th part of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out of his house and possessions every man who does not keep this promise. So may such a man be shaken out and emptied. At this, the whole assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. 
we did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and every ten days an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people. Remember me with favor, O oh my God, for all I have done for these people. I'm going to divide our uh, analysis of this chapter then into four sections, four C's. Number one, verses one to five, the people's complaint. The people's complaint. All is not well in the Judean camp. Their men and their women raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers, verse one. And the word that is translated here as outcry is exactly the same word as was used to describe the Jewish people's complaint against the oppressive rule of the Pharaoh when they were held in bondage in Egypt. And yet the complaint is not this time directed at a foreign oppressor, but at fellow Israelites. This is an intra-communal affair. You know, last time we were thinking about Israel's enemies or Judah's enemies like Sambalat and Tobiah. But this is strife within the Judean camp. And the backcloth to this strife is widespread economic hardship. And that hardship resulted from a combination of factors. First is verse three tells us famine. Secondly, verse four tells us that taxes had to be paid. And I am tempted to quote Benjamin Franklin's famous dictum, in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. The Greek historian Herodotus refers to, in his writings, to the high burden that the Persians placed upon the satrapy of which Judea was a constituent. And third, unscrupulous men were exploiting others' poverty by lending at excessive rates of interest or taking uh, land and property as collateral or even their sons and daughters as slaves. Now clearly, this could not all have begun, you know, just when Nehemiah became governor. But no doubt the fact that many men, and indeed um, some women, had foregone working on their farms in order to join in Nehemiah's rebuilding project would have then accentuated their economic plight. And recall that, as we saw last time, the workforce, they were not returning to their homes in the evening, but were remaining within the confines of Jerusalem. So instead of working on their plots of farmland, they were working on the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls, adding them to their sort of economic loss. So there was a manifest discontent amongst the Judean populace. So the people's complaint. Secondly then, verses six to 11, we have Nehemiah's charge, Nehemiah's charge. Nehemiah is absolutely enraged by this callous exploitation, a case of righteous anger indeed. Wisely, he takes stock before launching his attack 
on the culprits. Verse 7, I pondered them in my mind. And it's always a good thing, a wise thing, when feeling anger, even righteous anger, to just take a step back so that we don't speak out of turn or say something that we will later regret. Nehemiah, having pondered the situation, then levels his accusation. What the rich are doing is not right. It is a breach of the Mosaic law, which forbade the charging of excessive interest or usury, and of course the exploitation of the poor. It was also bringing the name of God into disrepute, the name of Yahweh into disrepute amongst Judah's pagan neighbors. How ironic that having previously bought their fellow countrymen out of slavery to Gentiles, the Judahites were now choosing to enslave them within their own community. And Nehemiah thus issues a firm order that these practices must cease and indeed recompense must be made. All seized property and excess interest must be returned and that with immediate effect. So that was Nehemiah's charge. Thirdly then, verses 12 to 13, we have then the nobility's confession. The nobility's confession. The nobles and officials are initially stunned into silence. No self-defense is forthcoming. Verse 8, they kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. And this is followed by a pledge that the abuse will end and that they'll make amends. Verse 12, we will give it back and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. A statement of repentance. And yet, Nehemiah is no soft touch. He wants their promise made official. As we would say, he wants it in writing. So he calls an assembly and makes the nobility take an oath to follow through on their commitments. And he also adds a curse. If anyone doesn't do as promised, he'll be expelled from the community and forfeit his own possessions. But let's give credit where credit is due. The nobles and officials did follow through on their promise. Repentance led to a change in behavior, at least for a time. Fourthly, verses 14 to 19 we have then Nehemiah's charity, Nehemiah's charity. So these remaining verses of chapter five tell us about Nehemiah's conduct as governor of Judea. They tell us something of what he didn't do and what he did do. First of all, in stark contrast to his predecessors, Nehemiah chose not to take his entitlement of food and wine from the people. Nehemiah recognized that their lives were difficult enough and he declined to add to their plight by living off their produce. Secondly, rather than add to the tax burden on the people, he paid his hospitality bills out of his own pocket. Third, He and his men refused to purchase any property for themselves. There was no investing in the accumulation of a property portfolio and no business sideline to compete with the task of government administration. Fourth, Nehemiah displayed enormous generosity. Each day, 150 of his countrymen supplemented by some foreign guests, 
enjoyed his lavish hospitality. Oxen, sheep, poultry, and all varieties of wines were on the menu. And remember, such provisions were not being funded by the ordinary citizens of Judah. There was no expenses scandal here, no junkets to visit, say, the gardens of Babylon, no duck ponds paid for by Joe Bloggs, or should I say, Zachariah Bloggs. No, Nehemiah was generous to a fault, and he took care of his own tab. Now, in the remainder of our time then, I want to um, draw out three lessons. And as before, the first of these will uh, draw upon Nehemiah's leadership qualities. So the first one is integrity, integrity. Thus far, we have seen in this series, we have seen that Nehemiah was a man of prayer, a man of courage, and a man of wisdom. Those were the three leadership qualities that we have drawn out to date. So the fourth one was, he was a man of integrity. He comes across as someone whose conduct was beyond reproach. Now, I should say, there are some commentators who think that Nehemiah had also been guilty of exploiting his countrymen by his own lending practices. And that's based on verse 10. I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But the difference here was that there was no usury involved or the taking of others' property or even persons as collateral. Otherwise, why would Nehemiah have been so incensed when word came to him of Jewish malpractice in this respect? You see, lending was permitted under the law so long as it didn't involve usury. And given what is recorded in the remainder of chapter 5, it just seems implausible that Nehemiah would have been guilty of seeking to cream off profit from any commercial relationship with his own countrymen. Indeed, we must admire Nehemiah for his refusal to insist upon exercising the privileges of office. As governor of Judea, he was entitled to taxpayer support but he chose to finance his official business out of his own resources. Now, of course, Nehemiah was a wealthy man, but we know that many a wealthy man has become wealthy on the back of exploitative practices. And some wealthy men are, let's face it, downright stingy with their possessions. Recently, I watched a film about um, John Paul Getty, the life of John Paul Getty. I think it was called All the Money in the World. And when in 1973, Getty's grandson was kidnapped, Getty at that point was apparently the world's richest man. But rather than agree to the kidnapper's ransom demand, he negotiated it right down to a fraction of the original sum notwithstanding his grandson's ear being cut off and being delivered in the post to Getty's daughter-in-law. But then Getty was so mean that he even had a red telephone box installed in his 75-acre English mansion so that guests couldn't make calls from his residence at his expense. Now, obviously, this is an extreme. But is our government as removed from financial impropriety as Nehemiah's administration? Do all our politicians exercise probity and restraint when it comes to the conduct of office? 
Do they refuse the perks of office? Well, I'll leave you to answer that question. But lest I be accused of promoting undue cynicism, let me state that some of our politicians are, of course, beyond reproach. Unlike his predecessors, Nehemiah refused to lord it over the people, verse 15. Nehemiah was no sort of self-interested ruler. He was extremely generous with his possessions and he sought the genuine welfare of those in his charge. And integrity is a vital property of a godly leader. Those in positions of authority, whilst of course they will not be uh, perfect, but they must be beyond serious reproach. They must be, in the Apostle Paul's terms, blameless, Titus 1, verse 6. Their probity should not be in question. They must be morally upright citizens who are not given to greed or the exploitation of others in their conduct. Listen to the Apostle Peter's admonition to elders in the church be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. 1 Peter 5 verses 2 to 3. Nehemiah was such a leader, an example to all those in positions of authority, whether that be elders or, you know, Bible class leaders or creche leaders or whatever. Indeed, let's face it, all who take the name of Jesus as Savior and Lord should be marked out as people of integrity, not just those in official positions of leadership. That then is our first application, the need for personal integrity. The second one then, our second sort of lesson for today is to do with social justice, social justice. The prophet Micah famously exhorted God's people to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before the Lord. But it's not just our own behavior that should concern us. We also need to possess a social conscience and do what we can to promote the cause of justice in our world. Nehemiah was outraged by the Judean nobility's exploitation of the poor. In particular, by corrupt lending practices which resulted in the expropriation of land and indeed the selling of sons and daughters into slavery. And as governor, Nehemiah acted decisively to terminate such offensive practices. Of course, not all slavery was forbidden in Israel. But there were strict stipulations surrounding its operation, and any slave relationship was always time bound. It was, there was a time limit on it. It was never designed as a means by which the rich could exploit their poor brethren. So Nehemiah was a social reformer as well as a master architect and builder. He was not merely concerned with Judah's physical security, its walls, but with the moral standards that governed its civil society. And it's greatly to the credit of Christianity that it was men of faith like William Wilberforce who fought to officially abolish the grossly mutated form of slavery that arose in later centuries. 
But we know that slavery is still alive. In Castlereagh Fellowship, one of the uh, advocacy organizations that we uh, support is, of course, International Justice Mission. And IJM estimates that there are still around 40 million people in our world today living in slavery. And that is actually more than at any time in modern history. Indeed, on the very day that I wrote this talk, a Center for Social Justice report was circulated suggesting that there were just under 100,000 people living in modern forms of slavery in the United Kingdom. Many of these people are women and children. We can think also of bonded labor uh, in, say, the brick kilns in, in India, or children forced to work in the fishing industry on Lake Volta in Ghana, or young girls treated as the property of pimps in, say, the Philippines. These are things that we should be outraged by. And we should do what we can to bring these practices, evil practices, to an end. Praying, giving, advocating, and supporting those who are engaged in the effort to prosecute the perpetrators of such evil and the rescue and rehabilitation of their victims. But social justice goes well beyond slavery and abusive labor relationships. We should each have a concern for the poor, the indebted, the hungry, the homeless, um, the victims of domestic violence, the social outcast. And yes, it can become a bit overwhelming at times, but for the Christian, there can be no defense of moral indifference or so-called compassion fatigue. As God's people reflecting his character, we possess an obligation to be informed, to be prayerful, to be generous with our resources, and to be advocates for actions to address this vast sea of need and injustice. So we've had integrity and we've had social justice. And our third and final lesson then for this morning is hospitality, hospitality. Nehemiah made it his custom to entertain both citizens of Judah and foreign visitors. And he did so daily and with lavish generosity born out of his personal means. The Apostle Paul instructed Christians living in Rome, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality, Romans 12, verse 13. And similarly, the Apostle Peter declares, offer hospitality to one another, adding, without grumbling. 1 Peter 4 verse 9. Hospitality is not to be engaged in reluctantly, but willingly. And of course, hospitality is increasingly a way for us as Christians to reach out to non-Christians. Uh, wasn't it Vimal, uh, one of the core missionaries that Castlereagh Fellowship supports working with uh, uh, refugees in, in Germany. Wasn't it Vimal who termed, or who coined the term gospitality? Gospitality. Rosaria Champagne Butterfield. Now there is a name. She entitled her recent book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. The gospel comes with a house key. 
Having a non-believer around to your house for a meal is a real opportunity to witness to them about the love of Christ. Now, not everyone has the same opportunity to do so. And I'm certainly not suggesting that it should be a daily occurrence. But pretty much all of us could do something here. And even for those of us who do not possess much in the way of culinary skills, thinking of nobody in particular, there is always the takeaway pizza option. Who, after all, apart from our own Leonard in Castlereagh Fellowship, doesn't like pizza? Thank the Lord for those in Castlereagh Fellowship who do abound in respect of offering hospitality. And I would wish to encourage them to keep up the good work. Now, at the time of recording this superb talk, the dreaded COVID has placed severe restrictions, of course, on the hospitality option. But let's pray that in due course, we'll be able to get back to the days of having folks round uh, to our houses for a bite to eat, even if we might have to sit a little bit further apart at the dining table. That, I think, is sufficient for uh, this morning. Next time, then, we will bring this series on Nehemiah to a close. And we'll actually, we, really what we've done is, apart from chapter 3, which I effectively skipped over, we've done chapters 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6. But we're going to be taking a big jump forward into the final chapter of the book, chapter 13. I'm tempted to say, unlucky 13 for you, but then as Christians... We don't believe in luck, so I'll not say that. Amen.